last night in 30 minutes, I made about $14,000 um, when I gave a webinar. Yeah. And in $59 increments, my phone actually makes a little ding when I make a sale. So I was like, Bling. that's so fun. And that was the same amount as my first year of revenue. So I've actually, it seems I've gotten better at starting businesses or I've gotten lucky in order or something. Welcome to today's episode of Invested Success. I am your host, Elise, and I can't wait to present today's guest, Jeremy Schneider of the Personal Finance Club. Jeremy retired at 36 when he sold his company for over a million dollars. And then after taking a year off to play video games, he took an interest in personal finance and teaching others how to become millionaires themselves. To date, Jeremy is worth over $4 million, most of which has been created through index funds and investing. And he shares how he went about building his wealth today on the podcast. So if you want to learn the smart, practical, wise, and easy way to get rich, that's what we're going to talk about. Before we get started, please remember to smash that like button if you're watching on YouTube and subscribe wherever you happen to be listening. Please give a warm welcome, round of applause to Jeremy Schneider of the Personal Finance Club. Welcome, Jeremy. What was your inspiration for, for going this Instagram route? Well, I started a company, I'm going way back now, but I started a company in college and I sold it at the age of 34 and I quit my job at the age of 36. And so I was unemployed. And then for like a year, I played StarCraft II and I was not very good at StarCraft II. And then over the new year holidays, I like left for on vacation for like a week and a half or something and came back and I had like temporarily broken my addiction with the video game. And I was like, you know what? That last year was not a very like, productive year of my life. And I don't really want the rest of my years to be like that. So I uninstalled the game that day and haven't played since. And then like, you know, days later, I started an Instagram account called personal finance club because like my passion in life, spoiler alert, it's super boring is like basically helping people learn about personal finance and investing. And so I was like, you know, it would be fun just to like become a social media influencer, despite my previous career being like, a keyboard jockey behind the scenes or whatever. And so I started posting every single day and it sucked at first. And I started reading about how to make it better. And here we are. Wow. That is the perfect segue into the question I was going to ask you and why I've been like semi fascinated with you for a while. I really love your story about how you sold your business. Are you able to talk to that a little bit? You did, did you do that like right out of college? Is that right? I'm able to talk to it in great depth because I spent most of my life doing it. And I also like have a commitment to transparency. So I challenge you to try to ask me a question that I don't answer. But in college, I interned for Microsoft for two summers. I was studying computer science and I got a full-time job offer from Microsoft. Similar to when I was playing StarCraft II for a year, I didn't really like my life there. I didn't really like being a cog in the machine. I like, I wanted to like feel more like progress in the work I made, not just, you know, being like a tiny part of this much bigger thing. So instead of taking this job, I decided to not take the job. And then my options were like, go join the Peace Corps or something crazy like that, which I think I would have done, but four hours tied to the city I lived in because the girl I was dating was not yet graduated from college. She had like another year after me. So I was like, well, I can't leave the city. I don't want a real job. And there aren't really you know, the options when you're here except to start a company. That was basically it. And I didn't really see myself as a sole entrepreneur at that time. I was very young and shy and stuff. You know, if there was like two other people who were like, hey, we got this brilliant idea. We just need like a coder. I would have jumped at it, which is kind of ironic because now I feel like those types of deals don't usually work out very well for the coder. But yeah, that's why I started the company then. Never took any funding. Didn't, didn't ever get any venture capital or anything like that. Didn't borrow any money. I just simply worked and spent less money than I made. I grew the company to about a million dollars a year in revenue and then sold it to a much bigger company for $5 million, which is how I was able to retire early. Wow. That's really impressive. What services did the company offer? So the company is called Rent Links, R-E-N-T-L-I-N-X. It's still out there. It's basically a rental housing advertising service for landlords. And so if you're a renter, you can look for an apartment online at Zillow or Craigslist or apartments.com or rentals.com or apartment guide. And there's like 50 of these different apartment search websites that renters can go to, but that creates a challenge for landlords, which is how do you post to all these different sites and keep your listings updated? And so I made a site that is 
basically a syndication service where you can post once to rent links and automatically appear on all those different sites at once. If you change a photo or change the rent or uh, change the description, all those different sites will be updated and all the leads, you know, the phone calls and emails from renters are routed back to you and they're tracked and you can t tell where they're coming from, stuff like that. So yeah, that's what they did and that's what still does. That's an actually quite genius business model if you ask me. What was like the flow? Like, what did you have to do from day one? How did you come up with the idea? Did it come to you in a dream? Were you really methodical about it and investigated a couple of things? None of those things, actually. It only sounds good, I think, when I explain it in 15 seconds after 12 years of practicing it. At the time, it was much messier. In fact, the company wasn't called RentLinks at first. It was called Hercules Solutions, which is what the 21-year-old version of me thought would be a cool name. At that time, Hercules Solutions was just trying to make money so that I would not starve and could go to the grocery store and buy food and things like that. And so I was just doing whatever, like anything it would pay me for, basically, including I was a part-time carpenter for a while. But then I sold, basically sold a website to my old landlord. And I was like, ooh, like my old landlord bought a website. Maybe some other landlords would buy a website. And it was literally over the course of like two and a half or three years before the company even formed a product that looked something like it does today. To my credit, I didn't give up, but to my discredit, I think I would have done better had I more aggressively sought the feedback of my potential customers and iterated more quickly. Because what I really was doing was just like building something and then trying to sell it. And then it didn't work very well. And then as I slowly over the years got better at that, finally found something that worked pretty well. So yeah, it was, it was, it was a messy, long, windy road and only worked due to persistence. If I had to do it again, I would have kept the persistence, but I would have introduced more iterative learning. So I would get to that, you know, end point quicker. That's really wise. Yeah. What's it like building a million dollar a year business? What is that journey like? That sounds maybe stressful and overwhelming, or maybe, maybe not. Tell me. It was a lot of different things. It was 12 years of my life. Early on, it was very hard. No one wants to give you money at first when you're like a 21 year old kid and you're like trying to sell them software or whatever, you know, so making those first few sales were hard. My first year in business, I think our top line revenue was $14,000 before expenses were paid, which were probably $4,000 or something. And so I basically got to take home $10,000, which this was the year 2002 or so, but still was not enough money to live on. You know, my rent was, you know, 600 bucks or something and 600 bucks times 12. I'm almost out of money at this point. So I was living on credit cards. And so for the first year, I basically racked up $10,000 in credit card debt. So I lived on $20,000. $10,000 of income and $10,000 of credit card debt. But then as you know, after year two, I was still losing money. Year three, we were making money. I was able to pay off my credit card debt. You know, as we went on, we started hiring employees and there's seven of us eventually. So it was always like a small business, but you know, I also like was a relatively conservative business owner. I didn't spend beyond our means or anything. And so after the first few years, we actually got to a point where we had like six or eight months of cash in the bank and we had a recurring revenue business. And so there's like very little likelihood of just like, you know, not being able to make payroll or something. Still, it was like a lot of uncertainty and we were still small in a big world. And I was like, someone's going to sue us out of existence or, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But, you know, you just kept pushing and trying to improve one little thing every day and try to increase how many customers we're getting and make the product better and make the search engine optimization better and the marketing and the, you know, like entrepreneurship is like mostly just about like doing 10,000 little things pretty good and improving all of them all the time. That's what I try to do. And it was nice. That's incredible. That's so impressive that not only did you really wildly succeed at this and now you're totally rocking the personal finance game technically how does the revenue come in for that business like do you have recurring subscription customers or like where does how does that all work if you don't for know which business rent links rent links specifically but we'll dive into more more nerdy Great. personal finance stuff if that's okay in yeah time. well personal <laughs> finance club is now a business too in fact it's kind of funny last night in 30 minutes i made about fourteen thousand dollars um, when I gave a webinar, yeah. And uh, in $59 increments, my phone actually makes a little ding when I make a sale. So I was like, ding. That's so fun. And that, which is the same amount as my first year of revenue. So I've actually, it seems I've gotten better at starting businesses or I've gotten lucky in order or something. Rentlinks was just a, a subscription service, basically. I think there was a couple different payment options. You know, I, I sold that company seven years ago now. And I stopped working there five years ago. But yeah, landlords would basically pay a monthly fee to use it. I think some of the fee was per use. So they, they would only pay 
and this is still true. You'd only pay when you actually get a lead. So you could say, Hey, and it was 10 bucks a lead. So you'd say, Hey, I want 20 leads a month, which is 20 new renters emailing you 10 bucks each. That's 200, 200 bucks a month. And so we would track like, what's the most money we could make based on the limit everyone has set. And we'd make sure what we're like as advertising all these properties as widely as possible to like fill up those limits. Um, and then, you know, we could, you know, it was very predictable, even, even like holidays and stuff. We knew that no one searches for an apartment over Thanksgiving or Christmas. You know, the goal was just to get more landlords to say, Hey, here's part of our marketing budget, send us leads and then send them leads and get paid. Very cool. I must ask, like, what was the process of selling? Did you court buyers or did someone approach you? It's a great story that I'm very comfortable sharing. And that's a good point because I think my last business was despite making, you know, less money, at least in the early years than my current business, I think it was definitely much more acquirable. You know, big companies see that bank of customers, that line of revenue that's increasing, that's like recurring. And it makes it a very like attractive asset to buy because they can figure out what they're going to get out of it. My current business, which is just me on Instagram, um, mostly giving away content for free, but occasionally selling a course, like there's not really much value without Jeremy, the person, but that's okay. Cause you know, I'm not, not trying to make something to get acquired. I'm trying to have fun. But there's one year where I went to the National Apartment Association conference, which is like this huge convention where some of these companies were spending like, they literally throw a party that costs a million dollars. So like they would have like these big name bands, like, you know, massive bands that like everyone hears on the radio all the time, show up and like play at this party and like unlimited drinks and food. And, and I, I was looking at this, I was like, man, this, this other company who's like a competitor of ours essentially is spending our annual revenue on a party at a con. I was like, I was like, we are like a minnow in the ocean swimming with sharks. And I was like, we're either going to get bought out or we're going to get like stamped out somehow. But I knew that the market was very good for selling companies, you know? So I knew that historically companies would sell based on a multiple of profit. So if your company made a million dollars and spent $900,000, you have a hundred thousand dollars of profit. And then that company was, is worth, you know, what they like, they usually say like three to seven times the profit. So that company would be worth like 300 to $700,000. And it makes sense because the buyer wants to take that profit and get their return in three to seven years. But when I sold my company, our profit is actually about $25,000, but we sold for $5 million because we, we were valued on a multiple of revenue. These are, this is none of the questions that you asked, but this is just what I was thinking about. So anyway, <laughs> at this million dollar party, I was like, we're going to either get sued out of existence or we're going to get acquired. So I basically started a plan to collect tons of data. So I know we had a lot of customers and we had a lot of data, data being like the, the apartment listings. And I knew this data was very valuable because like renters wanted it and it's what made apartment search websites valuable. And so I was like, we should get more of this data so that the other, these big players like Zillow and realtor.com and apartments.com and apartment guide who have all this money, they will be threatened by us getting acquired by one of their competitors. And so I went to, not to those guys, but I went to a different set of companies, which were property management software companies. This is like all really nerdy. I'm talking about this in a while and hopefully you're following and it's not too boring, but I think it's okay. fascinating. You're totally good. good. Yeah. Thank you. I would tell these property management software companies. These are companies who also had landlords as their customers and said, Hey, you guys are really good at doing like accounting and inventory and stuff like that. Why don't you send us the marketing data? And then we will syndicate it out, do what we do best. It'll be, I'll do it for free for you. And then you'll have this benefit for your customers. And then I'll be like quietly collecting this like pool of all this data. And so I, I made, a, made a big list of every single company that I want to partner with in this way. And I was working up the list from like the worst prospect to the best prospect with the best being like the biggest and fastest growing and basically made zero progress on this whatsoever. But then the biggest prospect was a company called Appfolio, which is like the most tech savvy, fastest growing. I had some of their customers emailing us basically complaining about this problem. And so I was like, all right, maybe, maybe I should just skip to the top of this list. And so I emailed that folio and was like, Hey, your customers are emailing me complaining about this problem. I can fix this for you. And so they're like, they actually responded they're like the first one to respond. And so we had a meeting and they said, no, we hate it. We don't want to do that. We never partner. We don't, we build everything in the house. We don't want to send you our data. And so I was like, well, thanks for taking this meeting, but what are we doing here? Like why, why if the answer was that hard? No. And then at the end of the call, they're like, well, sometimes we, 
you know, invest in or acquire businesses that are interesting. And so I was like, whoa, because like that acquire word is like, at least to my ears was like, uh, ding, 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 this is the exciting part. And sure enough, that's a company that ended up acquiring us. That we had another meeting where they were much more clear about their intentions. And then, then there's like, you know, four or five meetings with where I was spending a full time, my full time job was like building out a PowerPoint, basically detailing the guts of this company. And, you know, they could have been just like shaking us down for information. And if they did, we would have, you know, wasted a lot of time and given away a lot of like proprietary information. But, you know, I was aware of that and assumed that they weren't doing that based on like what I knew of them and what they were saying. You know, I might've been wrong and gotten burned, but I didn't, I wasn't. Um, and then one day I'm in San Diego, California. They were, they are headquartered still in Santa Barbara, California. I drove up the six hours or so to their offices. And then we had an all day meeting. And then at the end of the day, there's like, they give us this little printed out agenda. And at the end of the agenda, it said like negotiate purchase price of company <laughs> or of rent links. And so we literally sat in a conference room and negotiated the purchase price in person, which is I, which I was like advised not to do, but I decided to do anyway, based on what I thought of this company and this deal. And, you know, basically I didn't know how I was going to go down. I was like, how do you even negotiate these like big numbers? I was like, is he going to like write it on a little post-it note and like slide it across the table? He did not. He actually had a PowerPoint that was like, in my opinion, designed to like lower our expectations being like. This is why your company's, you know, this is why we're not that interested in most of your company. This is, this is all the other companies we could have bought that were worth, worth more, but we would have paid less. And then he said, well, we were willing to pay $3 million for your company. And so I was like, oh, that's a lot of money. Like I was broke at the time, kind of went back and forth and finally landed on $5 million. And so that's how we, how I sold my company. That's such a great story. I love financial independence stories. Looking back now, do you think that it, you sold it for the right price? Do you wish you sold it for more? Do you think you got a good deal? I mean, it's very easy with hindsight to like manufacture things you could have done differently. And I have a list of those. Like, I think I could have shopped at that point. I could have shopped my company around more. Probably should have. It would have been like, you know, a couple hours of work for maybe doubling or tripling the price. Could have held on to it. And, you know, it just, it turns out that after I sold the company, I wasn't as afraid of, as, of losing that free data. So we basically made our service, what used to be a free freemium thing where you could use it for free and upgrade. We made it a pay only service and that doubled our revenue overnight, pure profit. So I was making $2 million a year instead of 1 million and basically a million dollars a year of profit. And if you have a million dollars a year of profit, you know, you can just do nothing for five years and make $5 million. But I didn't know that, you know, I, I could have, you know, I could have sold it all and put it all into Bitcoin at $150 a coin. Didn't do that. Now, a lot of things I could have done differently, but, you know, basically no regrets. Like I'm, you know, my life is good. I really like the company that acquired us still in really good terms with them. I think they like have done well by me and my team and everything. So yeah, life only marches forward and I'm happy with the deal. Yeah. Yes. I think everything about it sounds played perfectly and is very brilliant. That's not what I was up to at that age either. So congratulations on being really smart and savvy right out of the gates. I mean, like I said, it sounds better talking about it in retrospect, knowing that there's a success, but certainly at the time it, it felt messy and uncertain. And there's a lot of bad days, a lot of emotional roller coasters where you're just like, this is never going to work. I'm wasting my time. I'm going to be an embarrassment, a failure, you know? So, and who knows, like maybe it, it's just pure luck that it, it worked out. It's hard to tell when you like have the survivorship bias of like only, you know, hearing the success stories, you know? That's exactly what I hear from every founder who sold their business. And I've had a few on this show at this point, really an intense process when you're in the middle of it. If you could go back and give yourself any advice during that time, do you have anything you think you might say, or do you feel like it played out all just as it was supposed to? Like you're doing perfect, Jeremy. Never change a thing. No, I would tell myself to buy as much Bitcoin in 2010 as you can get your hands on, of course. You know, I think my general business advice would have been to like more, I kind of mentioned earlier, where I'd like more aggressively collect feedback from my customers to try to build the thing that's going to impact their business um, instead of just like, because I was a software developer who was just building the thing that I thought they needed without really understanding their businesses. And that was a much less successful and much slower process to get where I needed to go. But, you know, I do give credit for the persistence. I, you know, persistence is like the right way to say or the nice way to say it. There maybe the not so nice way is like stubbornness where I just, I didn't want to be seen as a failure. So I never stopped. I never like quit the company and it, you know, it eventually pays off. Almost thankful that I didn't ever end up buying any. I remember like a year, a day in 2010 where I like, I learned about Bitcoin. I saw it was six cents a coin and I was like, like, should I buy like a hundred bucks worth of that just so I have some? And then I like thought I was like, 
no, there's there's zero chance that a Bitcoin would ever be worth the same as a dollar. I'm not going to waste my time. And, you know, spoiler alert, it's now worth like $47,000. But if I had bought some, I probably would have sold it a dollar, like, you know, claimed, claimed that I'm a genius uh, for like 10 xing my money or whatever, made, turned it 100 into 1,000 and, and spent that 1,000 that in Vegas or something. And then it's, it's easy to say what you would have done if you bought it at six cents and sold it at 47,000. But like, that's not how life works, you know? Oh, Jeremy, I could talk to you about that all day. So I, like, I was in the Bay Area in 2017 and I was working at Bitcoin conferences, hanging out with all the Bitcoin influencers. And I remember the day of the Bitcoin conference that I was working on, it had crashed and everyone was really sad. I actually know the founder of um, the first Bitcoin ATM. He saw its future. He like knew it was there. It's just the issue of being like too early of an adapter to that stuff because you lose faith in it by the time it gets mainstream and explodes. So I had some friends who were forecasting the explosion of Bitcoin. I texted my Bitcoin ATM friend and was like, do you think I should get some? And he's like, no, screw Bitcoin. And of course I was just, yeah, I was so, I really regretted that one. I have to say, but it is true. If you were in it and I know many people who were, that didn't necessarily mean that you would have hung on to it because you might've sold it at like, you know, 20,000 a share or whatever. So yeah, I agree. It's, it's really easy to have that FOMO, but you know, can't beat yourself up over those choices. Well, you've already done, I mean, so successfully as well. And I really like some of your stories. First of all, I mean, I have to ask, what does it feel like to have a million dollars or $5 million? How much dropped in your bank account that one day? I have to ask because you're so transparent. Yeah. So my net worth the day before that was like $100,000 or so, which was, you know, 12 years of working where I was just making $36,000 a year and then investing about $500 a month, which is like about $60,000 of my money I invested. Plus the market went up. So it was like $100,000, kind of like the old fashioned way. And then, yeah, the day that my company sold, they did a wire transaction from their bank account to my bank account. And they sent about $2 million. I owned 70% of the company. My mom owned the other 30% and the, and the employees got a share and like our lawyers got a share and like, you know, was, and then, and then a million dollars went to taxes. My share of the company after taxes was about 2 million bucks. So yeah, it went from 0.1 million to 2.1 million. And then today my net worth is about 4.5 million because I invested all that money. And now seven years later, the market has doubled or so as it tends to do every seven years. And so now I have $4.5 million, which is nice. I think that in life in the US, we, a lot of us see like our primary struggle as being financial. You know, every decision seems to have this like financial implication, like, oh, if I wasn't working, I could do this, or I want to go on vacation, but I can't afford that. Or if I had this car and because it's always there, it feels like that's your biggest problem in life. And then when you remove that restriction, like not that much really changes. You know, I think people think the world's going to open up. And like, I think I did too. Like I was, I remember talking to the CEO of the company that acquired my company and I was like, all right, when I get paid, like I'm, I'm moving to like Tahiti and just like living on a beach. And he's like, and he said, but what are you going to do when you get back? And that was like a very like insightful comment because I could, I guess, go move to Tahiti, but I don't have any friends in Tahiti. And I think that living on the beach. I'm not trying to knock Tahiti, you know, just like anywhere tropical or whatever, but living on an island somewhere tropical probably gets like really boring after a few weeks of it. Who knows, right? And when I was playing StarCraft II for a year, which is still waste time, probably not as fun as being on the beach even, I realized that like a lot of joy in life comes from having some tension, you know, and, you know, having something that you're striving for working against like that's like what humans feel good about is like making that kind of progress against that struggle or that tension and when you remove money as this like de facto tension that impacts every decision that you make then what right and so for me that's why i started personal finance club because i was like exciting to build something again but otherwise you know like the money hasn't really like in my life and my maybe my life was a little bit different because people like all my friends already knew I was starting or owned an internet company or whatever. And people are so shy about talking about money for societal reasons. Like maybe people already assumed I was a millionaire. I don't know. Um, and so I didn't like have a lot of like extended family coming out of the woodwork or anything, asking for money. I had like no negative impacts. And then the, the positive impacts haven't been that much. Cause like I said, like living on the beach, isn't really the dream. I don't like the best things are things. The best things for sure are two things. One is just like freedom with my time. So I can 
now like seek out those struggles that I choose fit, like helping people with personal finance or coaching high school beach volleyball or whatever it is. And the other best thing is like, I don't, I no longer like look at prices at the grocery store. Like when I was in college in my twenties, I was like painstakingly comparing, you know, generic brand and national brand and price per ounce. And, and now I'm basically like, Hey, Jeremy, if you're at the grocery store and not ordering Uber Eats, you're already killing it financially. And so I just buy whatever you want. I heard something recently. I was like, if you, if you could like for $20 million, would you trade places with someone who's 80 years old? And I think, I hope everyone, you know, everyone who's not 80 would say like, of course not, because you know, what good is it if you're going to die soon? Right. And so time is really more important than money, healthy food and healthy fitness are you know, pretty important parts of life. Absolutely. I love that. Although I have to say I am one who is, I'm not off to Tahiti per se, but I'm definitely going to go on a sabbatical and travel Europe and like South America and probably like Tahiti. I love, I've been to those places except Tahiti. I love traveling and yeah, I, I still have a dream. Like I'm unmarried, but I have a dream of like when I find my forever partner is to like go, there's these, there's these plane tickets you can buy where it's unlimited flights for one fixed cost but you have to like always land further east than you started. And so it's like basically around the world ticket, unlimited flights. And so you can like zigzag up and down the, you know, continents or whatever. I was like, that'd be so fun just for like a year. And, and I don't even want to like do a whirlwind tour, like take two weeks or a month per place and just like live and enjoy and like be part of that world and not have to like, you know, hit every touristy spot and then like hit the road again. That sounds amazing to me. I went to Hawaii after I sold the company, but that was, I was like working. It was kind of like a, I was, I, when I was in my twenties, I was like, well, I, when I make my millions, I'm just going to like, but then when I was like, I, mean, like, I had a job, I had to like make good on the thing I just sold or whatever. So I never got that like big trip. All right. Yeah, I could do it now. Yeah. 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 I'd love to know, like, that's the whole thing with the terms and conditions. I'm surprised you can talk about the acquisition because everyone else I've had on the show can't really say anything. So they didn't give you like a gag order or anything like that. If you're listening to this and not watching it, I'm like shrugging my shoulders. <laughs> um, and, you know, and on my personal finances, I'm very transparent. I've never heard from someone at the company who is like unhappy with how transparent I talk about this. The reason that I feel slightly secure and saying numbers like this is because after my company was acquired, Appfolio went public like two months later. There's a form you file with the you know the federal government when you go public and you like basically transparently put everything about the company in this form. Because if you don't do that, and then people buy and sell shares of your stock on the open market and they found out that you were like keeping a secret from the public, then you like go to jail or whatever. And so, you know, the terms of the acquisition, which happened two months earlier at that time were like material enough to like be listed in this document called an S1. And so it literally just plainly says how much they paid for, for, uh, for rent links. And also like, what are they gonna do? I mean, like I say, what are they gonna do? But like, I really like these people. Like, I think if they really asked nicely, gave me a good reason to not be talking about that specific part of it. Um, you know, I would consider respecting their wishes. I'm not like mad at them or anything, but I just think that like it's public information. It's not that big of a deal. I think they're also really good people. I think they see the benefit in educating young entrepreneurs and, and re removing the stigma around talking about money and stuff, which is kind of like my thing. So, well, I love it. Cause there's nothing Great. a podcast host loves more than like full transparency. We're yeah. like, yes, <laughs> let's open my bank account. Let's just, let's scroll through. Um, <laughs> but I, I, cause I feel like a lot of it isn't really like for any good reason, you know, like, honestly, I, th if I, I think if I had kids or something. I might be a little bit more concerned about safety. Like, like I don't really, you know, my net worth, I'm not even literally not even the 1%. And so like, there are like, you know, billionaires out there who are like more at risk of like being kidnapped or something like that. So for me, I don't really think there's really any real safety risk. And other than that, I think it's supposed to like societal thing, like the stigma around like saying how much you make. And it's not like, it's not just me. It's like, if you make $60,000 a year, people don't say, don't tell me when you make $60,000 a year. It's like, who cares? Like 60,000, 600,000. Like, why does that have to be a secret? It's just for some weird American reason. And honestly, I think it starts with employers who like don't like their employees talking about how much they make because then they talk to each other about that. And then they find like gross inequities and that doesn't benefit the employer when they're trying to like sneakily underpay certain people or whatever. And so I don't like that. So actually at my current company, Personal Finance Club, there's just currently only two of us, one of which is me, but we have a, a Google doc and a policy of putting everyone's salary and profit sharing percentage directly in this document. And if you don't like it, 
then you can, you know, you can look at what everyone else makes. And if you don't think it's right, you can like talk to me, the boss, you know, and there's only two of us right now, but then as a boss, like I have to back up. I have to say, yeah, that's what you're worth. And if you don't like it, you can quit. Or I have to say, no, you're right. That's not what you're worth. And I have to like, I have to own up to that. That's amazing. I'm all about the negotiation and the transparency as well. I think anyone who's been a business owner is always like, you probably should ask for a raise and that kind of thing. Cause I think a lot of people don't realize they should, but that's really cool. Who, who else is on your team in personal finance club? Last October, like 11 and a half months ago, I was so bored during the pandemic. I turned my little hobby Instagram account into a business and launched a course. I think we made $110,000 in the first week, which was bananas. And then I was able to hire someone and I put out like a job application or job post and had, I even didn't make it easy to apply, like to apply, you had to solve a puzzle. And the answer to the puzzle was the email address to apply. And I had like 250 applications or something for one job, which was like overwhelming. But Vivi in 12 hours made this like whole, like very like highly produced video with like, like deep knowledge of like, you know, my personal finance account and her skills and all that stuff. Yeah. And I hired her and it's been crazy. And yeah, she went from part-time to full-time and got a big raise and is getting profit sharing. And we're probably going to hire again soon. I have a job post that's already written up. So we'll be a three-person company. Well, the first time we got applications from like lawyers and like Mayo Clinic surgeons. And like, there's like a bunch of like very like successful people who like just liked this as a hobby, like I do. Yeah. You know, I'm part of it. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, obviously. I mean, we're both really into it. So that's cool. I know. Plus you're like somebody I would definitely bet on. Like if I could get out a border company, it would probably be yours given yeah. your track record. So <laughs> that's me just doing a good job faking it with not a whole lot to back it up, but maybe that's how life works. <laughs> no, no, no. Your track record speaks for itself. So when did you find your passion and love for personal finance? When I sold the company, I made $2 million overnight and I started reading every book I could on personal finance and investing. It occurred to me that like all these books say the exact same thing. And it's a message that's not really popular in mainstream culture, right? Mainstream America, you hear about buying a primary home, leasing a car, spending all your money, Amazon Prime, credit card, spend, 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 spend. That's not how you get rich. How you get rich is you, you know, I have these two rules of building wealth. Rule number one is living below your means, spend less money than you make. And rule number two is invest early and often. That's how rich people get rich. They spend less money than they make. And with the difference, they invest regularly and become wealthy. The investing side of that is also very simple. It's basically buying and holding index funds or buying and holding real estate. You know, there's some slight modif modifications on the real estate side, but like it's basically pretty simple stuff. But even in the investing side, it gets really muddy in like pop culture. It's like day trading and MLM scams and whatever Forex is and investing through insurance because insurance salesmen are some insurance salesmen who are selling some types of insurance are among the least honest people I've ever come across in my entire life. And it's very hard as a regular new consumer investor to like sort out who's telling the truth and who's not. I was like, what's more, what's more timely at this point in, 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 in our society than a rich white guy mansplaining money to people. And I was like, I need to create an Instagram account. And here we are. I mean, so what, were there any personal finance books that you found that you just felt like were a revelation or was it all kind of like the dry stuff that you waded through to then memify it to, to us Instagrammers? Memify. That's, that's basically what I do. If I have like one special skill, it's like taking this, these very dry finance books and memifying them. I've never, I've never used that word before, but I like it. One of my favorite books is a book I'm actually thankfully read very recently. And I say thankfully because if I had read it originally, I would feel like a total fraud who was just copying off him because as I was reading this, I was like, yep, this is exactly, he, he and I are Facebook friends now, although I don't really know him. His name is JL Collins. The book is A Simple Path to Wealth. And I think he would admit also that like the reason we have the exact same idea is because it's Jack Bogle's idea, who's the founder of Vanguard. Both of us just have maybe made a slightly more mainstream, simple explanation of that, you know, whatever the difference is, there's can be some very minor differences in how we present it or whatever. But, you know, if people ask for like one book, that's the one that as you say, one of the first books I read was called a beginner's guide to investing, which was like a hundred pages on Amazon. It's one of these little, like, it's almost like a cliff notes kind of thing. There's like two bucks on Kindle. And it's like, I actually really like it. I think it's a really nice, it's just like, it kind of like just covers the highlights of all these classics on investing. And I think it does a good job. A Random Walk Down Wall Street is a great book. That's like another one that kind of like 
pokes all sorts of holes in these like myths around day trading and different types of, you know, speculative investing. So I have a, I have a reading list on my website. If you want to hear other books like personalfinanceclub.com and you can just search reading list. I love that. I can't believe you're Facebook friends with JL Collins. I'm such a fan girl. So I don't think he has any clue who I am. I think you can just <laughs> friend him and he will be your friend. I bet he knows who you are and thinks you're cool. We've never DM'd. Oh, I'm going to add him now. Will you okay. add me on Facebook too? Just so I can be a yeah. friend of a friend of jail Collins. Oh so. yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> if you know this bot, you must be a good bot. I mean, from one nerd to another, my husband has found some really interesting ways of day trading and value investing that are next level. So this is not the beginner finance 101 stuff, but if you ever want to hear about that, have you ever dabbled in any of that stuff? Sure. I guess I have a hard time believing it's going to outperform buying and holding index funds over the long term. You know, I do believe in having a go wild portion of your portfolio. So I have this 90 10 rule with like 90% of your portfolio buy and hold index funds with 10% go nuts. If you're so good at outperforming the market, then your 10% will quickly out, outpace the 90%. And if you're not as good, then at least you didn't blow, blow your whole uh, portfolio. That is my thoughts as well. I'm a little risk averse and I, I've had to work on that actually. Like I was a cash hoarder for a decade and now that I know how easy it is to invest, I'm just angry at myself. So I had to start this podcast for past Annalise to get her to do what I wish I had done. But that's why I really loved that Instagram video you posted where that was me in my twenties. Like what's so hard? Where do I do that? So I really liked your uh, fidelity finger Instagram video. <laughs> nice. Do you just film these all at home or like, how do you, how do you put them together? TikTok is like a crazy platform right now. You know, I'm doing a lot of stuff with my life, but if I were to have one focus, try to get as big as possible, I would be trying to make one TikTok, like one pretty highly produced TikTok video every day. Cause I think that's how, like the quickest way to like millions of followers, but yeah, they're just in my house. Like they're on my phone. It's like kind of an amazing time because a lot of people watch game of Thrones, for example, which is like this fantastically expensive, you know, highly produced series from HBO that took years to make, but like TikTok has almost like the same number of eyeballs and hours. It's crazy. And like just a person with a phone with like a clever little idea can like get their share of those eyeballs. It's like a very weird time where it's like this massive opportunity. And it's almost like the low production quality almost is endearing because it feels like you're in their home where you're just like hanging out with them. And so, yeah, like that one, I was like, I was in the shower and I had this moment of inspiration. Uh, if you're listening to this, you know what I'm talking about? It's basically like two versions of myself. Two, I'm playing two characters, one of whom is like the real me and one of whom is like a lazy, whatever guy. And he's like, no, no one ever tells you how to invest, like how do I invest? And, and, you know, so like real me is trying to like coax him through it and like grab his hand and like try to click a button on a website or whatever. So yeah, I just, just film. And when I do those two characters, I just have a little tripod. It's right here actually. And I film one character and then I go upstairs and then shave and like change my hair and change my shirt. So it looks like there's like some time passage between the other, between the other one and then film the other side of the conversation. And then Vivi now edits most of them. But if I'm like really excited about it, I'll edit it myself. Cause I don't want to, you know, she's probably busy doing something else. And then, yeah, we posted Instagram and, you know, sometimes like we've had some get like millions of views on Instagram and some get like, no, I'm sorry, not Instagram on, on TikTok. We post in both places, but TikTok's definitely the one where it can go viral. Whereas Instagram just kind of, you get a more reliable views from your own followers. I know TikTok is like what Instagram was a couple of years ago. And I wish I jumped on Instagram. So I'll probably have to get on TikTok. That's like, as a business person, you know, my, you know, personal finance clubs business is like almost entirely reliant on Instagram right now. Um, if our Instagram account went away, I'm not really sure what we'd be left with to be honest. Like, you know, we've got an email list, we've got a website, we've got a TikTok. I definitely would prefer to have people coming directly to my domain, to the website we own. And so, like you said, that's, it's not good when, when, a platform dies and suddenly you're left with this. It's like ghost town of former followers or whatever. I've seen it happen. I don't think it will happen to you because if you've got a website and a list, then you're good. But like Facebook's algorithm change, I think the app store will make one little change and suddenly your whole business has got to pivot. So that's why I'm apprehensive and wary these days. Don't blame you. I feel the same. It's definitely not good to like be at the whim of, you know, what one decision from one of those tech giants that can like squash you like a bug. Completely. But you're diversified as a smart investor is. So, yeah. <laughs> Not that, like I said, if Instagram went away, we wouldn't be left with a whole lot. It'd be kind of, we'd be in shambles, but you know, hopefully we could rebuild somewhere else the way we, we built with uh, Instagram. 
Well, you can come be my podcast host, uh, co-host if you want. Oh, um, great. Yeah. You, YouTube is good. Like that's uh, one that I've seen hasn't completely faltered the same way other social media places have. And it also seems to be a little bit more <clears throat> secure. Like it's like a real channel that you can build a real following and have consistent, you know, viewers and stuff like that. It takes a lot of work, I think, you know, to, to produce good YouTube content. Um, we haven't really gone in that direction. Like we have, you know, a YouTube channel with just some you know, just a smattering of followers, but I would like to. How did you grow so fast on Instagram? It sounds like you've picked up some really cool tips, tricks, and hacks. What were your secrets to that? Yeah. So I started two and a half years ago with zero followers and just created the account and I started posting every single day. So I was like, all right, I'm going to post once a day. And that was like my plan for a month, which sounds like a very short period of time. And it is like I basically was getting no traction and I was trying really hard. I was like messaging my friends and posting to Facebook. I was like, come follow my new thing. And like, you know, I think I had like a couple hundred followers in a month from like, you know, shaking down my personal network or whatever. I said, all right, Jeremy, you're, you purport to be this entrepreneur guy. Why don't you like treat this like growing a business? And so I was like, all right, I need to stop counting followers. I need to start counting what's called the lead metrics. A lag metric is the thing that happens after all the work is put in, but you can't directly influence that. So like, for example, if you're trying to lose weight, you can get on the scale every single day and be like, oh, I wish I weighed less, but you can't just lose a pound. That's not something that's actionable. Um, whereas if you start tracking how many miles you're walking and how many calories that you're intaking and improve those numbers, then the weight will definitely improve because it's, it's predicted by the lead metrics. And so I was like, all right, what are the lead metrics for followers? And so I decided they, the three that I decided to track were how many times I'm posting stories, how many times I'm making posts like feed posts, and then how many times I'm commenting on other people's posts. And so when you comment on someone else's post, it creates a link from their post to your profile. And if you do that zero times, there are no links to your profile. But if you do it like 10 times a day, then there's 70 a week and 300 a month links out in the Instagram ecosystem that are pulling back to your profile. And so I started tracking these things. I literally made a Google sheet that had these three columns and I tried to get those numbers up. I was like, all right, I'm going to post more stories, post more feed posts, and then I'm going to get out there and comment. And, you know, I wasn't spamming, you know, just because you're tracking number doesn't like relieve you of having to do good work. I was making good, high quality posts. And I was also trying to iterate on what was connecting with people and looking at, you know, the feedback and looking at the stats, like the views and stuff and trying to make stuff that connected better. And then doing a lot of like insightful, interesting, funny, whatever comments on other people's posts. And then the numbers started to move, then the followers started to move. Right. And so like true to form when the lead metrics improve, the lag metric improved, then I kind of had a few like little viral things where I was shared by a bunch of accounts and, and grew. I remember there was a day where I asked this guy, he had, I had like 200 followers and he had 500 followers and he was making good content. And I was like, I was like, Hey, you want to like have some collab, you know, we can like share each other's stories or, you know, whatever. And, you know, it's like a little bit of a corny thing to message someone. So I don't really blame him, but he's like, he's like, nah, bro, I'm just going to do my own thing. And I was like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and so I was like, hoping to partner with them with 500 followers. And today I have 295,000 followers or something like that. And so I bet you if I asked him to collab today, he would say yes, but you know, who knows? Well, I love your content. How do you come up with the ideas? Well, I guess you said the TikTok video, but like I said, the, the memification emojis and all of that, like, like, are you just really brilliant at just stop distilling down these concepts into emojis yes. or does it take a lot of work? Do you design them yourself? Super brilliant. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Until Vivi, I, you know, made everything from scratch, hundred percent of the content, our feed is original and our work. We don't like copy. We don't like hire third-party graphic designers and copy other people's content or anything, but a lot of people copy ours. Like it's crazy when I like scroll through like explore page or whatever, like the search page, it's, I always see my posts in other colors, you know, like these other meme accounts. And it, I think it honestly hurts me. Like I'm not verified Instagram and, and there's, I've had several people inside of Facebook and Instagram who like have tried to get me verified. And the, basically the feedback that came back was like, you look like a meme account. And so I was like, it's so like, I would call it like a original infographic account, but since everybody copies, you know, it's not just me, like I'm the only one that does this, but like since tons of crappy accounts out there are copying all these, like, and repurposing all these memes slash infographics, I just kind of like at quick glance look like that. Although when people like actually sit down and read my stuff, it's not the same. I have like a big, I use Google keep, which has like these little post-it notes. And I have a list called personal finance club ideas. And it's like, 10 pages long of like one line ideas. 
And whenever I'm driving or in the shower or working out or DMing with someone, I'm like, I have ideas because, you know, the more you produce the content, the more ideas that come up. Um, like just literally yesterday, someone was asking me, what's the difference between an ETF and an index fund? And I was like, oh, like an index fund is like when you get bulk, right? Or index or mutual funds. Like when you get bulk rice from the grocery store, an ETF is when you like get prepackaged amounts of rice. Like you buy those in discrete bags and a mutual fund is like buying in bulk. I was like, oh, there, that's a meme right there. And so then uh, that was what today's post was. You know, Vivi brings some ideas now. That's extremely cool. I like that. You're right. I think a lot of people feel overwhelmed starting a new endeavor, but the truth is it thought like getting started is the hard part. I remember when podcasting felt really overwhelming and intense. And then once you get started, you're like, oh, that person should be a guest. Oh, I should do this. And, and like, that's the secret because you just get better the more you do it. Yeah, totally. I think that's like, you know, I follow Gary V who is like this kind of like social media inspirational guy and he's guru. You know, yeah. Guru. He's like a social media guru. And he's just like, just start creating content like don't think about so much like it's gonna suck it sucks for everybody but like you just have to start and iterate and get better and and like if you haven't been doing it for like a year or two and putting out like hundreds of pieces of content like you can't you have no no space to complain it's not working because you don't even know if it's working yet so yeah that's why i did and my early content i have so many posts now it's hard to find it but if you scroll way to the bottom my early content really sucked it was ugly it didn't like connect with people you know you just have to like kind of make it better over time Oh, that's so wise. And by the way, that like lead metric thing, genius. What were some of those metrics that you had for building your business that you used? So so yeah, like revenue in a business is like the ultimate lag metric, right? Like when you have a business, you're like, I wish we made more money, but like, that's not an actionable thing. You know, it's like things that you can actually do to like drive and, and lead metrics are historically or like hard to identify and hard to track. Like the lad metrics are easy to identify, easy to track. Like if you want a weight loss, you just jump on a scale and it's obviously what you want, but knowing what things lead to that are harder. So I don't know. I'd have to think about what we're doing for Red Links. And I don't think I've even defined any lead metrics for personal finance club. Like if I was going to, I might say things like partnerships, you know, when we have a partnership, like we do some like uh, webinars with, with other influencers out there who like we respect and do an awesome job and they're not directly in the personal finance space. So like, for example, there's an Instagram account, whole life nurse, and we have an upcoming partnership with her where we're basically like bring financial literacy to her, her like followers that are largely nurses. And it's like, perfect because she's like, yeah, and these nurses make a lot of money, don't know what to do with the money or don't know what to do with the, uh, the money to to like build wealth and retire one day. It's perfect for us because we get to like spread our message to like a, a new audience. Genius. That's really smart. What's a widely accepted belief or piece of advice you strongly disagree with and why? Here's my new rant I've been giving lately. High yield savings accounts. So this is personal finance, but I feel like so many financial influencers are like, get yourself a high yield savings account. You're leaving money on the table. If you just have your money in your check account, it's just like all due respect to my fellow little influencers who are doing great work. But like this specific thing is just such nonsense because it doesn't move the needle. You know, it's not advice that's going to actually make a difference in someone's life, especially right now where high yield, I'm making air quotes. If you're listening to this, um, high yield savings accounts are paying like, you know, way under 1%, like 0.5% or lower. And so if you have, you know, if you put your emergency fund in a high yield savings account, it might make you like whatever, 50 bucks a year or something. If you're spending your time working on 50 bucks a year kind of work, like just give up. Like it's, it's not even like 50 bucks, like go get a job at In-N-Out Burger or something that'll make you more than 50 bucks. And it's just like, it's just such lazy advice because it's like, yeah, of course, high yield is better than low yield. But like, if you really want to make a difference, like you need to like learn a little bit about investing or you need to like lower your expenses or you need to get a second job, like something that's going to like actually move the needle, but it's attractive to give this advice because it just seems like, like, oh, wow, look at this clever financial influencer who told me how to make more money, but like, don't even bother work on things that are move the needle. So you go. There's commonly given advice that I think is nonsense. I didn't even know that was advice still. I'm glad you're calling that out because like Uh I'm a victim of high yield savings accounts. I was like a money hoarder for a while with my little savings account and no index funds. So Right. It can be like inversely beneficial because you think you're doing something when you're not. You know, if you move from zero to 0.5%, what you're really doing is you're not going to 10% like in an index fund with, with where you accept some volatility, of course, but that's like, what's really going to hurt you over time. 
So true. Also, like, I'm not even sure back in the day when I first got into personal finance, there were like 4% to 7%. And like, I lived in Australia for a while. They had incredible interest in savings. Yeah. All the stuff in US just doesn't even, you're just like, why would I even bother with this? So yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I think that has less to do with you changing continents and has more to do with just the times. Mm -hmm. Because actually, if you if you go back to like 1984, you could go to a bank and get a six month CD, which is like a certificate of deposit, where you give them money and they agree to hold it for six months and give you back with interest. Like today, six month CDs are paying, I think, like 0.1% or something. But in 1984, they're literally paying like 18%. And it just basically has gone down ever since essentially, there's been some and I think it will go back up one day. But I just feel like the government is so sensitive to raising rates because they're worried it's going to like have negative impact on like housing values and stock market and stuff, which I think is maybe short sighted. But what do I know? I don't work for the government. What is one habit, quality or action that you've taken that has made all the difference in your success? I think reading. I know it's like lame. I know it's a cop out. I'm starting another business right now with three other guys. That's a machine learning company. We haven't even talked about it, but just, just bear with me. And one of the other guys was like reading a book on marketing. And he said something along the lines of, I don't want to do exactly what this book says because that's what everyone else is doing. I liked the mentality there because you want to be, you know, innovative and unique. But I actually like spoke up. I was like, I kind of disagree. Like you'd be shocked how few people like read the instructions and then follow them. And when you do, it has some incredible results. Like you can literally make a successful business by just like reading a book and then doing what it says. Like that's literally what I did with this Instagram business. Like I had zero revenue 11 and a half months ago. And we're probably going to hit six hundred thousand dollars by our in our first year. And I literally read a book. It's called Launch. And then the subtitle is an Internet Millionaire's Secret Formula to Sell Anything Online and Build a Business You Love and Live the Life of Your Dreams. It's so corny, and it's like eighty percent nonsense. Do you know this book? Ah, uh, yes. He yeah. taught you how to do Instagram. I read that book. I was so a little teach me how to do Instagram. for a minute. Okay. Yeah. He actually, he's actually like super into email lists, which I like kind of like don't fully agree with at this day and age. But I did read a different like ebook on growing an Instagram, which I actually also kind of think sucked, but like even a sucky book is way better than no book. And I literally just like read the books and I do what they say. And I, I feel like I read Mark Cuban's, he doesn't have a book, but he has like, he wrote a blog and had, like compiled them into a book. And he literally like said the exact same thing. He's like early days in his tech career, he like worked at some computer company. Six months in, he was like the superstar of the company. And everyone's like, how'd you do it? How are you such an expert? He's like, He's like, I'm the only one of the company who read the manual on the computer. <laughs> He's like, I just read the book and I do what it says. Like, I hate to like victim blame or whatever, but like, I'm like, yeah, if you want to get ahead, like just read the instructions and do what they say. It's pretty effective. That's excellent advice. It's so true. I read like a book ninja, but thanks to Audible, I don't know if I would be able to power through books as I do if it weren't for audiobooks. They're my savior. Cause nice. I think everyone has different ways of learning too. So I'm really glad that tech like podcasts exist for people, but my yeah. husband is a major instruction reader. It, it makes a difference. He like laughs yeah. in my face a lot when he reads the instructions and I don't. <laughs> so you guys are just like, have to go on a main mandate. I'm serious. What is the most life-changing purchase you've ever made that you would absolutely buy again or suggest to a friend? Like I have this backpack and whenever I go on a trip, I like put my laptop in there, my Kindle, my cell phone goes in my pocket like a pair of shorts, a couple of shirts. And I was like, this is, I'm basically good now. Like I, like everything else, if my house disappears, like I could just Airbnb around the world forever. Yeah, I don't have a good answer. It's so lame. Like my laptop is really, and I didn't even buy my laptop. It's like seven years old and <laughs> my former company gave it to me. And when I was leaving, um, I asked if I could keep it and they said, yes. So I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to have it. I mean, someone said yes, so I'm probably fine, but I'm so non-materialistic. I don't think I have a great answer for this. I've never really bought anything expensive. The most expensive thing I ever bought was my car, which is a 2016 Mazda CX-5. It's a very nice car. It's five years old, five and a half years old now. That's a good one though. I'm the same way, all about the laptop. It's like my second brain. I, I don't know how I exist without it and really could care less about anything else that exists. But your house is really cool. Thanks. I bought this as a two bedroom condo. Uh, I bought it in cash because they wouldn't give me a mortgage because I didn't have a job. And uh, I gutted the whole thing and remodeled it. And so, yeah, if you're listening and can't see this, then you won't know what we're talking about. But it's a me, kind of a dude decorated condo. People ask me like, oh, you just like, you went from like living in, I was before this, I was living in a one bedroom apartment that was converted from a garage and to like this, you know, very nice newly remodeled two bedroom that's like kind of by the beach. That's not what makes you happy in life. Life is about like 
relationships and feeling progress and things like that. So it's not like every day I wake up and be like, wow, look at these hardwood floors. I'm so happy. You know, that kind of wears off after about a day. I like living in San Diego. I've got my friends here. So I probably going to keep this as home base for a long time. That's awesome. Yeah. I love, I love San Diego. I'm the same way. I'm a warm weather person. So I'd also love to hear your personal investing strategy, but I have a hunch it's very JL Collins. Is that right? Well, his is very Jeremy Schneider. I say, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I invest in two things index funds and real estate. I buy and hold. I don't time the market. I don't jump in and out of the market. I don't switch strategies. I, I do believe in that 10% go nuts portion of your portfolio if you want. And for me, currently that has at Folio stock, the company where I used to work. Although I sold, you know, basically every regret I have in investing is like selling. And I sold it, you know, lower than it is now. Like things tend to be. Um, I also own some Lyft stock just because Lyft was like valued at like a fraction of Uber. And I kind of think that Lyft might win that war. So I was like, yeah, throw some money in Lyft. It's done fine. But otherwise, yeah, I just buy index funds. And you know, it doubles every seven years. And like I said, I turned my 2.1 into 4.5 and growing. And it's enough money. I don't know. What else, what else, what else am I going to spend money on? I'm fine. That's genius. I actually was going to ask you more about your real estate strategy because I've got this ongoing debate that maybe you can memify. Real estate versus index funds. My parents are 100% real estate. My husband and I are were 100% index funds until somewhat recently. What are your thoughts on this? Either or, both, et cetera. Either is fine. One of the two is fine. Both is fine. I think both is probably best. I think like a very, very aggressive, hardworking real estate investor will certainly outperform index funds because they have the power of leverage and they're adding value through their hard work. But real estate's work, you know, it's like basically starting a company, you know, manage the deals, manage the revenue, taxes, uh, maintenance, responding, or either getting management or responding to all the stuff management has to deal with. You know, it's like, it's a lot of work and it's not work that I personally am all that good at or that passionate about. I don't really get excited, you know, being a technology guy living in current days, I don't really get excited about things that don't have like thousand X ceilings and more. And like real estate, it's like, Ooh, you can like it, you know, 14% returns, you know, year over year, which is great. And I love but I don't want to do any work to get it. I want to let the money work for itself and I'll go get the thousand X return somewhere else. And so they're great. And I, you know, which is better, like both are good because you can, you can diversify. I can't tell you which one's going to make more money because real, like while the stock market is very efficient and like an index fund is going to do what index fund is going to do, real estate is not very efficient. So you can value add based on like the part of the country you live in, which property you decide to buy. If you decide to flip or you decide to buy and hold or do long-term or vacation, you know, there's a million different ways you can, you can slice that real estate. What do you slice? Like an apple? Is there a saying? Slice a pizza. Slice a pizza. There's a million different ways you can slice that real estate pizza. Mm -hmm. Do you have a personal real estate approach that you're doing yourself? So I, my buddy and I started a flipping company a few years ago and we were, we'd buy a property, remodel it, sell it. And we did that four times. And then the last one, it didn't sell. And so then we started, we turned into a vacation rental, which was a lot of work, but like pretty good, strictly on the numbers. And then the pandemic hit and all of our vacation stuff stopped. And then we saw that the for sale market was still going really well. So we sold it. He had two kids in that time. And I didn't really like the work. And so we just basically shut down the company. And so now my only real estate, I own like some REITs and then I do some syndicated real estate deals, which is basically like, there are a couple apartment buildings in Ohio and Texas that I own like a half of a percent of where I just give a big chunk of money to some other person. That's, that's kind of sketchy stuff to be honest. Like it could get good returns, not good returns. It complicates my taxes to a great degree. So I hate it. I think I probably would have been just fine if I didn't do any of that. I just put it all into a single target date index fund, but you know, I didn't do that. I mean, it's really important to experiment, right? So it makes sense. And, and diversification is an interesting idea. A lot of people would say that maybe we're in an inflated market right now. What would you say to that? And what would you advise to like hedge it as somebody who maybe is like retired, for example? Yeah, I remember in 2013, everyone was saying the market is at all time highs, terrible time to invest, inflated market. And then they said that in 2014 and 2015 and 2016, 2017, and 2018, 2019 and 2020. And they're saying in 2021, and they're saying in all those years, because in all those years, those are all record high years. In fact, if you go back a hundred years, the market is like almost always at a record high because there's this like misconception about the market that it's like a yo-yo going up and down. 
and everyone thinks if it's high, it's about to go low. And that's not true. The market goes up. It makes headlines when it temporarily takes a step backwards because that is unusual. So in 1987, the market dropped like 20 some percent in a single day on Black Friday. Reports where I think these might not all be true, but there was reports of people like throwing themselves off of buildings and stuff because they've lost their life savings or whatever. But that was unusual, right? And then the market, guess what? The market ended up in 1987, like the year of 1987, it finished up. It just had a bad couple of days. And then a good next few months, right? Then in you know, 2000, 2002, dot com crashed, horrific, down 50%. 2007, 2009, financial crisis, horrific, COVID crash was actually the steepest and most dramatic crash in modern history where that stock market trigger that was like turning off the stock market if the market drops more than 7% a day actually happened four times in March of 2020, like most steep crash in history. Guess what? The market finished up in 2020. And so, you know, this whole like the market's high thing, I just like roll my eyes at. I actually did a little study. I went back and looked at 120 years of the stock market and looked at only months where the market was at an all-time high. And I think that's ha that happens about one out of four months, the market is currently at an all-time high. If you only invested in those months and never anywhere else, so you never bought low, you only bought high, you only bought at the market peaks, only when you can only look back and see the market lower behind, you only bought on those days, the average year following those months that are all-time highs averaged plus 11.2%. You know, when someone says, I don't want to invest in an all-time high, I said, yeah, I'll say, you don't want an 11.2% return likely coming in the next year. So yeah, I think that's nonsense. And yeah, and the yo-yo thing is like the incorrect mental model. The market's not like a yo-yo. It's more like a yo-yo walking upstairs. And so any given day or any given week, there's this volatility. But if you zoom out a little bit and watch this yo-yo guy walking up this set of stairs, you know, by the time he's at the top of the stairs, that market low is going to be much higher than the bottom of stairs market high, right? And so, and you don't know because like, because there's these steps involved, because there's this yo-yo involved, it kind of looks a little bit erratic, but over time, the market is basically the measure of all past economic output. You know, the companies of the world that are profiting and growing and feeding that, that growth and dividends back to the owners in the form of an index fund and it's getting reinvested and growing and growing and growing. It's just gonna, you know, it always goes up until there's some sort of like uh, the sun expands such that it's edges engulf the earth and then we will all be dead and no one will care about index funds. Except me, I'll still care. We'll care yeah. together. Okay. <laughs> so well described. That's where your meme memification talents come in. I can see it. Especially as a meme, that was like a five minute, very wordy rant, but I want to see like a yo-yo TikTok now with stairs involved. I literally and, like, bought a yo-yo just for that. See, I have all these props today. Um, perfect. Maybe I should do a TikTok of those. I thought it was going to be a picture, but maybe it could be a video too. That's so cool. So if you were to start from ground zero today, suddenly everything's wiped clean. You have to do it all over again, become a millionaire. What do you do? If I'm really from ground zero and like I need food tomorrow, I would get a job because that's the reality of the world is you can't just immediately start making money, I would go get a job. I'd probably, you know, right now, service jobs, I think are paying a lot because people are in desperate need of waiters or whatever. So I might go get a job. I used to be a waiter. I'd probably do that again. Maybe I'd work at in and out or something. If I have my same brain, I'd probably just do what I just currently did. Like I just start another, you know, I mean, whatever I want, I guess, but in this case, in Instagram influencing thing or whatever, but in general, I would just find something I'm passionate about, like read the books on it and then execute. And then start a company as a side hustle, wait till that company is making enough money that I can quit my day job, then double down my efforts. And then, yeah, that's what I do. And then I become a millionaire or just keep, was the question how you become a millionaire or just keep your job if you like your job. And then you invest 250 bucks a month. There's no time in history over which of, over 40 year period where 250 bucks a month doesn't turn into a million dollars in, in the US stock market. The worst it's ever performed is like right at the bottom. If you end right at the bottom of the financial crisis, we end up with like $1.3 million. The average is like around $2 million and the best was about $3 million. So yeah, just invest in an index fund over time. You'll become a millionaire that way too. Very smart. What if you had to do it in like five years? In five years? Well, like I say, if you want to become a millionaire, buy and hold index funds over the course of your career. If you want to become a billionaire, you have to start a company. That's how billionaires are made. And so five years is, five years is tough. You know, I, I say, I haven't made this up, but other people say this, that like overnight success takes about a decade. And so five years is like a very tough timeline, 10 years more realistic. And, you know, some people can obviously do it in five years, um, depends on, you know, luck and all that stuff. But yeah, I'd start a company and just aggressively grow it. I mean, you know, like as a personal finance club, it's first year is going to make about $600,000. So I almost did it in a year. I mean, but like, I didn't keep on money. We're donating 20% to charity. 
I hired a VV, you know, but you know, in five years, I, I'll definitely get there. I think that's genius. Go look to people who do a good job building. You can even DM them and ask, you know, if you ask 10 of them, maybe one of them will respond and tell you what, what they think is a good resource in general. I think like lean startup is a good tech book. I think the E myth E dash myth with E standing for entrepreneur and not electronic is a good book. You should totally check out Built to Sell by John Warlow. I had already read it, but recommended by another guest. Have you read that one? I haven't read that one. Oh, you'll love it. It uh, it kind of talks about what we were talking about at the beginning of the show with the SaaS model and all that. Speaking of which, I'd love to hear more about Nickel if you want to just give me the 30 second elevator pitch. Oh. It looks really cool. I love machine learning and, and Eric Reese, I know him. I'm a big fan of lead startup. I used to work with them as well. Oh, basically three buddies of mine were all about the same age. All computer nerds have started a company called Nickel, N-Y-C-K-E-L, that does machine learning as a service basically for developers. And so right now, the state of the world is such that things that were impossible five years ago are now very possible. And so for example, maybe we need to go back like 10 years for this to be totally true, but like 10 years ago, it was very hard for a computer to tell the difference between a cat and a dog. Like we just didn't really have that technology, like an image of a cat and a dog, right? And so like humans are very good at that. Like you can look at an image and very, very accurately say whether it's a cat or a dog, but to program a computer to know that is very hard because you're like, well, do you look for fur? Do you look for where their eyes are? Like you can't really like declaratively say what is a cat or a dog. You just kind of know when you see one. Inter machine learning, which is like this, like this massive advance in research where now based on like the amazing research being done at universities and, you know, companies and stuff. Now machine learning experts can like write programs that can tell the difference between a cat and a dog and this whole other huge set of problems that were impossible before. And so the state of the world today is that like that stuff is all possible and like big companies are using it, but for the average developer to basically use machine learning in their code is very difficult. You have to learn a whole new language. You have to learn a whole new set of like rules and understand like, you know, a whole, a whole set of stuff that's probably months at least before you like have the like hello world version of a machine learning um, app running. And so we basically made a platform that can take that months long process and bring it down to minutes. They basically just start by uploading your data. You tell it what, what the data is supposed to do, and then it can do that thing on new data. So for example, like you can implement cat versus dog in like two minutes on nickel by uploading 15 pictures of a cat, 15 pictures of a dog, telling it which is which, and then all future cats and dogs, it can tell apart, which is crazy. That is so impressive. That's really a genius idea. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> There's only four of us and we're, yeah, we have like our first few customers. We're definitely still in the uh, letting people know about us stage. Very cool. Thank you for having me on the show and helping people learn about entrepreneurship and personal finance. I do always end with the message of how to build wealth. Find the two rules of personal finance club. Rule number one, live below your means. And rule number two, invest early and often. That's how rich people get rich. Although you, you had a stock windfall, it sounds like, but that sounds, that's, an, that's a good way too. Where can everybody find you? I'm very easy to find. Personal finance club. You can find me on Instagram, personal finance club, TikTok, personalfinanceclub.com, YouTube. You can Google it. You know, 98% of what I do is just giving away all, everything I can for free with no secrets. I have no behind the door secret, but if you do want to be marched through like from A to Z, how to build wealth using index funds, you can buy my course. Yeah. It's basically, it's like quizzes and videos. It's like, you know, at your own pace, about seven hours of content. We donate 20% of proceeds to charity. It has a uh, unlimited lifetime access. And 100% money back guarantee. If you don't like it for whatever reason, we'll give you all your money back. I'm trying to make you rich, not sell you junk. But yeah, it's a, it's a nice little course. So if you just want like a really organized systematic way to like learn this stuff, you know, as much as like Instagram, it's just not a really good platform for like organized information. It's just good for like daily reminder kind of stuff. So that's what the course is for. Yeah. 
Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on the show. That was everything I hoped it would be and more. I feel like I learned so much and it's always great to chat with someone who's as big of a money nerd as I am for sure. So thank you again. What was your favorite takeaway from this episode? I would love to know. Please drop a comment below if you're watching on YouTube or leave a review with all of your thoughts. I really want to hear them. Uh, as always, the most important part of the show is you, the listener. So I really appreciate you tuning in. And if you want to see more incredible guests like Jeremy spill all of their secrets to success, then the best thing you can do for me is drop a comment below, like this video, or hit subscribe because the more likes, subscribes, comments I get, the bigger deal we are to big shots and the more they're motivated to come on the show. So I can bring you quality guests if you do me the huge favor of being a subscriber. I really appreciate you watching as always. We have another incredible guest coming for you next week. I'm really excited about this one. I think you're going to love this episode. So be sure to tune in again for the next episode. As always, this is Elise Walsh with Invested Success signing off and I will see you next week.